So why study volcanoes? It's because we still don't understand why some are more explosive than others. Why do some ooze on the ground, the magma, and others, the magma explodes into the sky? For some, it's a, it's a tourist attraction. For others, they're killers, like the 30,000 people who died in a matter of minutes in a single eruption in the Caribbean. What makes the difference between an explosive eruption or a fizzle? Now, contrary to what you might think, the right approach here is not to go dashing headlong into a volcano while it's erupting. That's super dangerous. I don't do that. I have a 12-year-old kid. What most of us do instead is wait until the eruption's over and go out to the scene of the crime, because the volcanic debris has chemical clues that tell us what happened deep in the Earth before the eruption started. Literally a couple days ago, last week, I was up in the high desert of Arizona. I was looking at some volcanic debris, like this, these lava flows that are cascading down into the Grand Canyon at Vulcan's throne. And if the federal government hadn't been shut the night before, I would have been telling you fantastic stories about clinging to the walls of the Grand Canyon, looking at these lava flows. Fortunately, there are another 200 volcanic vents that are just outside the national park boundary that we had access to. And this is a great place to do our detective work, because lying around on the ground is all the frozen lava that we can bring back and do forensics with on our lab. We can zap them with lasers and ion beams to find out how hot the magma is, and how much water it contained in it before it erupted. Yes, it's the water, which we usually think of as the benign, life-giving substance that, in this case, as gas, is the explosive fuel. So for that reason, the perfect model for an eruption is a seltzer bottle. And I'm going to take the cap off the bottle and release the pressure. I'm going to shake it a little bit. Not supposed to get the equipment. And make an eruption. The CO2 in, 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 the, in the bottle came out as gas. In lavas, the gas is water, but the process is very similar. And what the seltzer bottle might teach us is that maybe just the amount of gas before the eruption, which just drives something more explosive. Um, and while that's a simple idea, it's actually a very difficult test, because how do we know how much CO2 is in the bottle before we open the cap? It's gone, it goes, Psh, what's there left to measure? So what we need is a little capsule that goes in the liquid and protects it when we open the cap. And fortunately, magmas have these little pressure vessels within them. They have little crystals that are, uh, encapsulate by mistake some of the magma. It's just an accident. And then when the crystal erupts and cools, the little magma inside the crystal freezes into a glass. It still has the water dissolved in it where we can measure it. And this approach has led to a whole decade of volcano science um, to study how much water is in volcanoes before they erupt. My students and I, when I was at Boston University and now at Columbia, we've been fanning out around the Ring of Fire in, in the Pacific. We've gone to some pretty far-flung places, like the Tonga Islands in the Southwest Pacific, where there's still a king, and the Marianas Islands in the Western Pacific, next to the deepest place in the ocean, and the Aleutian Islands out in the western uh, part of Alaska, where you can only get there by hitchhiking on a boat, and in, even in Nicaragua, where they have a sport called uh, volcano boarding. I'll let you guess what that is. <laughs> so what have we found out? You can just look at this picture and see for yourself. As you go from left to right across this diagram, the volcanic magnitude increases by a factor of a thousand, and the water contents in the magma only increase a little bit. So the water's almost uniform. In fact, the 60 volcanoes we've looked at, they all have between 3 and 5 percent water, and average at 4, they're nearly uniform. It's almost like there's a magic number, like 42, but in this case, 4, for the answer of magma in the universe. And while this is a pretty cool discovery and is telling us about something, it's not helping us with the uh, explosivity question. All, all, the, all the volcanoes seem to have the same water. So what is it? We have to go back to the drawing board. And the drawing board is the seltzer bottle. And you already know the answer to this. If I were to take the bottle and hand it to you and say, OK, don't let it explode in your face, what would you do? Yeah, you know what you do. Yeah, don't open it, smart. No, you have to open it. What do you do? You just crack it, right? You just crack it open. So there's, there's clearly a rate term in this. There's a speed to it. And maybe that's the same for magmas. How fast they move might be as important as how much water they have in them. So that's our next 10 years of work is looking at these crystals again as stopwatches to see how fast magma moves from high pressure to low pressure in the Earth. 
And so far, we found it can move at miles per hour before the eruption, literally a freight train heading to the surface and exploding. So we're fanning out around again in the world to look for the fastest magma on Earth. Because the hope in all of this is that we could hear it coming.、Uh, magma doesn't move quietly; it makes noises, it makes little earthquakes, just like the seltzer bottle. When we crack it, you can hear it hiss. Maybe the hiss makes you nervous because you know an eruption is happening. But if the hiss is small and if it's widely spaced, then we may be confident that it's going to be a small eruption. But there's a real concern that this can happen faster than than we can respond. In the time that it's taken for me to give this talk, which is just about exactly six minutes, magma can move. The fastest magma on Earth can move miles, and that's plenty fast to go from the magma chamber to the surface. But it's not very much time for us to blow the whistle and get people out of harm's way. So volcano monitoring is important, but it's not enough. What we need to do is understand ahead of time what a volcano has dished out in the past, so that we can understand and prepare ourselves for the future. Thank you.